let's turn our Bibles to First Timothy, a wonderful epistle in the, the New Testament. We have Apostle Paul writing to a young man whom he, he considers as, a, as a, a son, even though Timothy wasn't Paul's son, Paul's son according to the flesh, they had a very close relationship. And uh, we have here the letter Paul is addressing to Timothy as uh, the leader of the church of Ephesus. As you may know, Ephesus was one of the prominent cities or towns in the ancient time. A very pro prosperous city, culturally diverse, with all kinds of uh, currents of philosophy, doctrines, and the uh, famous philosophers in ancient times who influenced that city. So that's pretty much the background about Ephesus. Now let's go through uh, the verse. First Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So we have a very important revelation in verse 1 that Jesus Christ is our hope. There is no way you can have hope beside or without Jesus Christ. The only way we can have hope is in Jesus Christ. Many people are looking for all kinds of sources of hope. For some, one source of hope may be their wealth, their riches, their money. Another source of hope may be, may be their uh, earthly possessions, their, their work, what they built, what they, they achieved career-wise. But let me, some, let me tell you something, young man. The only way you can have hope in this earth is through Jesus Christ. You have many people putting their trust, their confidence in their earthly position, positions, but they still have depression. They can't even sleep. They don't have appetite, even though they have a lot of money to eat, but they don't even have uh, the appetite. They, don't, they, can't, they can't sleep. They need to, uh, to swallow tons of pills, uh, tons of pills before sleeping. So we have that revelation here, verse 1, Jesus Christ is our hope. There is no way we can have hope without Jesus Christ. The name Jesus Christ bears many meanings. One meaning would be deliverance from sin. Jesus Christ means the Savior or the Deliverer from sin. The Savior from sin. That's one meaning of the name Jesus Christ. Another name like we saw in the Gospels, Emmanuel, meaning God 
is with us. God is with us. Emmanuel. Jesus Christ means the way to God, the path to God. And another, dif- another meaning of the word or the name Jesus Christ, we see here in verse 2, uh, verse 1, rather, verse 1, Jesus Christ is our hope. Without Jesus Christ, many people are hopeless. Buddha with yoga cannot give you hope. Mohammed cannot give you hope. Krishna cannot give you hope. Many mystical Eastern or African animist religions cannot give you hope. The only hope we have is through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, I want you to appreciate this wonderful revelation in verse 1. Jesus Christ is our hope. Now, let's go to verse 2. On to Timothy, my own son in the faith. It wasn't a son according to the flesh. It was a a son according to the faith. So So, my own son in the faith Grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. The second verse also gives us something additional besides that Jesus Christ is our hope. In verse 2, we see that we have what? Let's enumerate. We have first grace. Two, second, mercy, and third, peace. Peace is one of the most sought after things in this world, earth. Who doesn't, who doesn't have a who doesn't who doesn't want to live in a, a peaceful way, living in peace? But unfortunately, peace is something the earth cannot attain, attain, meaning cannot obtain, cannot get. Money doesn't give you peace. So we have also, we, we, we saw also the same thing with hope. Jesus Christ is the same, the, 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 the only, only secret to get the real hope. I remember a few years ago, a prominent presidential candidate, Barack Obama, campaigned on the idea of restoring hope to the United States. At the moment, people thought they, they, are, they, are, they have lost any, any hope. Now, let's say 12 years almost after later, almost 20, 12 years uh, later, later, those people who uh, were hoping, yearning, longing after hope, I would say they are even more hopeless than they were 12 years ago when that presidential candidate was preaching hope to America. And that's a good example to show you that we only have hope in Jesus Christ, the true hope. Hope that transcends this earth. Because this earth, as we know it, will end someday, shall end someday. And beside hope, we have three things here. Grace, mercy, and by the way, God is merciful. Had not had God not been merciful, nobody would have be stand would have been standing here right now. God is very merciful. 
no matter your, no matter how great, no matter great uh, can your iniquities or your sins be, go to God, seek forgiveness for your, uh, from your sins, or for your sins, sorry, for your sins. Seek forgiveness. And that's the secret to be delivered from uh, a sinful life. And I, as I always teach, God cannot deliver us from what we, we like. God is not a divider of friends. If you have a strong friendship with your sinful nature, with your sins, with your carnality, there is no way God uh, can deliver you. Before God can deliver you from sin, first of all, you have to reach the degree of desperation. You have to reach the point where you call, you invoke God, you implore God for help. You call for help to be delivered. So God is merciful. So we have three things here in verse 2. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father. Yeah, God is our Father. But God is not the Father of everybody. You cannot call God your Father until you repent, you get baptized, and you become a Christian. The only way a man can become a child, a son of God, or a daughter of God, is through repentance. And after repentance, baptism. Baptism, repentance, a baptism. And then you can call God your Father. So we have God our Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want you to remark or, or to observe that we have, allow me that expression, two entities. We have our Father, which is, who is God, sorry, who is God, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. The two are separate. Jesus Christ, is not God our Father. If you believe in a Jesus Christ who is at the same time his Father and his Son, let me tell you something. You're believing in a demon. You're trusting in a demon. This is a good verse. That shows us the difference between Jesus Christ and God. The two are separate. Exactly what Stephen saw the day he was stoned to death after preaching fervently to the Jews that day in Jerusalem. He saw Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So Jesus is not at the same time his father and his son. Jesus is separated, is separated, is distinct from his father. Of course, he has a hundred percent of the divine nature. He has a hundred percent of the divine nature of his father God. He has a divine nature, but is distinct from God. God is greater than Jesus Christ, who is his son. And you can read later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, giving us the revelation where someday, when everything will be submitted to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself will have to submit to the Father. And indeed, Jesus Christ is already submitted to the Father. He submitted. The Father is greater than Jesus Christ. If you believe in a Jesus Christ 
who is at the same time the, his own father, at the same time his own son. I think you were following unbeknownst to you, you were following without even knowing, maybe a, a doctrine from Buddha, from Buddhism. We have here the real Jesus who is a Distinguished clearly here has been separated from his father. Those are the real doctrine. Those are the foundation of Christian doctrine. If you don't have this doctrine, um, you have strange doctrine. You have a strange doctrine. And unfortunately, many so-called Christians nowadays are worshipping nothing but a demon called Jesus who is at the same time his father, at the same time his son. No, we have Jesus Christ aside and his father aside. Let's go to verse... Let's read verse 2 again before we, we go on, we, follow, we continue. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and Jesus, and Jesus Christ. I want you to circle and, you see, and the Father, one, and Jesus Christ, the Lord. They are not the same person. Permit me to say person. Verse 3. As I besought you, besought you to recommend or to commend, or to exhort, or to admonish. So as I, as I besought you to abide still at Ephesus, to abide still, or to stay at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach not other doctrine. Nowadays, we are inundated by all kinds of diverse, diabolical, demonic doctrines in so-called uh, Christian circles. And by the way, a good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ should be ready to confront those false doctrines. And the way you confront those false doctrines is by teaching the truth by teaching the original doctrine of Jesus Christ, the same doctrine the apostle, the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ the taught in the first century. That's the way you rebuke. That's the way you confront them. Another way to confront false doctors and their false doctrines is to rebuke them, to denounce them, to expose them. A servant of God shall not be, shouldn't be shy at exposing. God did not give us a spirit of shyness or timidity. We have a spirit of boldness. We should be valiant for the truth. Do you remember that word? <laughs> valiant for the truth. Valiant. Because the word of God in Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 say, we hold the sword of the truth, which is what? The word of God. And don't, don't forget, one of the multiple names of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible is revealed in Revelation chapter 19 verse 13 saying, his name is the word of, yeah, you know, God, right? God. So, one sword we should hold, not one sword, the sword, the only sword we should hold is not a sword of a ancient samurai in Japan. Again, let me rephrase it. The only sword we have is the word of God, the word of God, the wonderful and unmatched word of God. Your weapon is not an 
AR-15. He's not a Japanese samurai sword. He's the word of God. So the way we rebuke and expose and denounce false doctors, false uh, doctors, false uh, preachers, false pastors and their evil doctrines is by the sound doctrine of Jesus Christ. And you cannot expose false pastors if you don't have the sound doctrine of Jesus Christ. That's why it is of the utmost importance for people engaging in the ministry to study deeply the Word of God, to study the Word of God in depth, as I was telling you, one day shouldn't pass without reading the Bible. You should read the Bible abundantly. And again, let me give you the same admonition I've been giving to you. Read the Bible when you're young. You still have time. You're not married yet. You don't have kids. You don't have a family. You don't have maybe a secular job. You have a lot of time. Go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from Revelation to Genesis, reading many times, many times per day. Reading the Bible shouldn't be burdensome. Reading the Bible shouldn't be a, 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 a boring or painful. It should be something you enjoy doing because as we see, as we see here, the Word of God, which is the representation of Jesus Christ. The Word of God is hope, peace. The Word of God is life. The Word of God is light. Without the Word of God, your life is in the darkness. In the darkness. So, the reason why I made this digression is because in verse 3, we see how Paul is recommending Timothy to rebuke, to confront, to expose that they teach other doctrines. Sometimes when you start exposing, you start denouncing or uh, rebuking them, they're going to say, oh, you're judging. Do not judge. No, the Bible says you have to expose them. You have to rebuke them. And it's the same thing we see in Titus or Titus chapter 1. You can read from verse 10 to 11 or 12 is a duty, is an obligation from God as a man of God, as a servant of God, to expose the, the evil deeds and the evil teachings of false pastors and doctors. You have to expose them with courage, with boldness, valiantly, valiantly, without fear, without fearing anything. Because when we are baptized in Jesus Christ, that means we are always dead. No, we are all, we, um, sorry, sorry, we are already, rather, excuse me, we are already dead. Dead. We are already dead. We are already dead. Fear death no more. Let me repeat it. Fear death no more. We are already dead with Christ. So we have to be bold for the truth. Valiant for the truth. If we have to expose the false pastors, we expose them without insulting them, without uh, uh, threatening them. We just expose the truth. And the way you, re you expose the truth, let me rephrase, rephrase it again. The way you expose the truth is by 
quoting the truth, by citing, citing the truth, by giving the word of God, you expose false word by the truth. Again, let me rephrase it. You expose falsehood by what? By the truth. That's why what you do is clear, it's simple. That's why you have to cling yourself to the Bible. Cling yourself to the Bible. Stick yourself to the Bible. Cling to the Bible. Read it. Swallow it. Chew it, kids. Chew it. Day and night. Chew it. From Genesis to Revelation, from Revelation to Genesis, chapter after chapter, going to the, the epistles, going to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the Theodomus, Joshua, and so forth, Numbers, go through the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, go to Revelation, go back to Genesis, Genesis from, uh, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, read it, chew it, swallow it, day and night, meditate it, as we saw in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 or Psalm chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. All right, verse 4, let's move on. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. In Christian, Christendom today, the so-called Christianity, which indeed is churchianity, to quote the wonderful book of uh, Frank Viola or Viola, Viola, I will, say, I will go with Viola or Viola, Frank Viola who wrote a book, Pagan Christianity, and he uses the word churchianity in the book because Christianity nowadays is based on fables and genealogy, genealogies. One patent genealogy is what? Christmas. Show me in the Bible where you have the word Christmas. That's a fable, that's the genealogy. And they lie to little kid child that Santa Claus going to come through a uh, a chimney or a fireplace to give candies to deposit or to lay gifts next to the pagan tree that is adorned with all kinds of shining shining things. So the example of what the Bible say, fables. What about Eastern? Eastern bunny chasing eggs. Those are pagan traditions. And we have to expose them. As Christians, you should stay away from pagan practices. You should run away, stay away. Look what is going on in churches today. They worship demons. On the guise of worshiping God and his wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in reality, they worship demons. Santa Claus is a demon. And by the way, if you don't, you, you, you don't know, Santa, Santa Claus or Santa Claus, try to invert. Santa Claus is an anagram for Satan. If you write Santa or, you know, on a piece of paper, you can inverse it and become, it, bec it becomes Satan, the enemy of our most high God. See, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister question rather than godly edifying which is in the faith. 
Nowadays, if you tell young Americans that you're not supposed to observe or celebrate your anniversary, well, you're going to be stoned that day. You're going to get stoned. But this is an example of fable and genealogies. Because we have to know the truth. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth, the truth shall set you free. Nowadays, the word of God is replaced by the culture, by human traditions, by customs. That shouldn't be the case. The word of God is the word of God. Yesterday, thousands of years ago, today, and forever until the magnificent and glorious and super excellent Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns. The word of God does not change. And nowadays, nowadays people are adapting the word of God to their customs, their culture, their traditions. We should be changed, transformed by the word of God, not the contrary. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, our mind should be transformed, renewed. We should be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Like myself, coming from an animistic culture in Africa, we have a lot of fables in Africa. We, don't, we have a lot of tradition in Africa. We have a lot of custom. But once I become a Christian, I had to get rid of all those fables, genealogies, tradition, most of which are purely demonic, evil. So why can people nowadays not get rid of their traditions, their custom to abide to the word of God? They should do the same. A true Christian is not the one who is trying to adapt the word of God to his culture. You should be changed by the word of God. Your mind must be renewed by the word of God. So there are a lot of genealogies, a lot of fable. Look, a uh, few uh, months ago, they celebrate St. Valentine. They even have the, the, the blasphemous audacity to call it saint. There's nothing sent in Valentine. Valentine is a demon. And if you do your research, you're going to find that the fable or the legend behind Valentine is sexual immorality, impurity, carnality. Those are examples of examples of what? Fables. And that's, the, that's Christianity today. Eggs of Easterns chasing after eggs, many colors, you chasing bunny Easter's. Everything behind the bunny Easter's or St. Valentine's, the so-called, uh, the so-called, uh, excuse me, the so-called uh, 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 celebration of uh, love. There is nothing love. This is carnality. With Cupido, the god of uh, 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 pornography. Those are demonic entities. And people celebrate, you see, in schools, in colleges, in workplaces, in corporations. Oh, happy Valentine's. Hey, we have a cake in the, 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 the corporate kitchen. Come, let's get, a, let's get together. We're celebrating Valentine's. Christians should not be partakers to those evil, abominable manifestations. Choose to be mocked, to be rejected, to even to be stoned, or even to be fired from the job, but stand on 
the truth of God. Stand on the truth of God. How many preachers are preaching what I'm preaching today? My prayer is to have a new army, a real army, not the Navy, not the Marine, a new army of young people standing up and sharing the truth of the gospel. That's my dream. People standing for the truth, valiant, bold for the truth. This is my dream. A new generation of young people who know the truth, who are set free by the truth, who are delivered from sin. They may be tempted, but who are strong, who overcame sin, mostly sexual immorality, because that is the number one problem for young people who know the truth and are passionate about exposing the lights of the gospel, the truth. That's the purpose. That's the mission we have. And if, and that's a noble mission. And I'm happy to be at the forefront of that mission. I'm happy to be at the forefront of that mission. Blessed is every young man who decides to be at the forefront of that mission to say, hey, we live in, a, in dark ages. I remember in my history classes, they were talking about dark ages. Let me tell you something. Those ages we learned in history, dark ages weren't that, that dark. <laughs> Do you know what are the dark ages? Who knows? Now, we are living in the real dark ages. Real dark ages. Spiritually, morally, everything is wrong. In those so-called dark ages, centuries ago, or maybe in the Middle Ages, or even before, or in the medieval uh, uh, era, I don't know if marriage between a man and a man who, <laughs> who was legalized at the time. So what you, our history lessons used to call, uh, are calling dark ages, let me tell you something. I would rather say those were the bright ages. We are the real dark ages. We are. We are the real dark ages. Everything is dark. Perversion, carnality. Look at the, the gay parade. And they call it pride. There is no pride in exposing, exhibiting your carnality, your nakedness, nasty nakedness. You have schools where they have exhibition with transgenders. In kindergartens, we are living in the dark ages. That's how we need to hold the sword, the sword of the gospel to cut into pieces fragments of the dark ages we're living in. That's it. That's what we have to do. The mission is clear. If a young man wants to em embark in that mission, he's welcome. We're going to provide him training, biblical training. And by the way, the training is not coming necessary for me. The training is coming from John chapter 14, verse 26, who says that the Holy Spirit will guide, guide you through the whole truth and shall teach you what you need to know. Somebody was responding to one of the videos I posted 
regarding Winton moving and powerful testimony. And he said, I think uh, what, remains, what remains for your son to do may be uh, to get enrolled in a good biblical college. <laughs> I couldn't miss that person. I expeditiously replied and saying, hey, tell me one verse in the Bible where the Lord Jesus Christ instituted biblical colleges. Nothing. Those are pure invention. And I replied to the guy, I say, the Holy Spirit is our biblical college. That's the promise from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that the, the Father was to be sent, uh, to be sent, uh, sent in his name, was to teach us all the truth. And I told the person who made that ignorant comment, because that's blatant ignorant of the word of God, I told him, hey, those colleges are nothing. Orchards where they germinate, people having brains filled with humanism, with theology, with sociology, and all the lodges of in the world. Nothing. They don't know God. Even myself, I spent many years in a so-called ministry. What I had, I obtained all kinds of certificates, but still living in sin, defeated by sin, not even able to overcome the slightest sins, meaning lying, being able to tell the truth. But I had many degrees, many certificates in that cult. In that cult, I spent like almost 24 years of my life in prison in that cultish environment. So my life didn't change. I was overcome. I didn't have peace. I didn't have joys. A joys. I was hopeless. So that's why I replied to the person. I said, no. You're wrong. You're ignorant of the truth. Those colleges, seminaries, or university are instituted by the Babylon system of Christianity, Churchanity. And in the, that book, of, by the way, Fan Vola, it gives you the origin of theology, the, the school, everything. Theology, you see? What a wonderful verse, verse 4. You see how we, we open a, a long parenthesis, a long digression. So, verse 4 again, we're still in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, uh, chapter 1, sorry, chapter 1, verse 4. Neither Give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in the faith in the faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of what? A pure heart. A pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Those are characteristics of a good Christian, a good disciple of Jesus Christ. And by the way, it made me sad when I think how vulgar, how trivial the word Christian, Christian has become. That's why I, I, rather prefer, uh, 
I rather prefer the word disciple because the disciple, the word disciple convey discipline and discipleship like in the army. We are in the army of Jesus Christ, but not in the army with tanks, with bombs, with rockets, with uh, whatever weapon, with drones or whatever weapon, uh, assault weapon. We are in the, the army of Jesus Christ and our weapons are enumerated in Ephesians chapter 6 from, from verse 10 to verse 10 to 17. We are in a spiritual war. We have to expose the truth. And the, the main characters of the Christian a pure heart. A heart without evil thoughts. Everything that is pure, good, honest, godly should be part of the, your, your, your thoughts. Pure heart. Not a heart filled with jealousy, covetousness, cupidity, envy, contentious, a uh, contentious uh, uh, thoughts, contention, or backbiting, quarreling. A pure heart. A pure heart. A heart that is forgiving. A heart that is loving. A pure heart. And let me tell you something. As the Lord Jesus Christ begins, begins his uh, uh, sermon in Matthew chapter 5, he says, Blessed are those who have pure hearts, because the kingdom of God or the paradise belongs to them. Nobody can enter, enter the kingdom of God with a defiled heart. A heart that is not loving, that is not forgiving. There is no way you can enter the kingdom of God with an evil heart. So if you think you don't have a good heart, a pure heart, repent and try to renew your mind with the word of God in order to get a pure heart. Still in verse 5, and of good conscience. Let me tell you something. God gave us something which is our God will, God will. And that God will is called our conscience. Our conscience is like an alarm. I tell you, you know, what you did, the way you talked to your parents, no, that wasn't supposed to be. Uh, the way you responded to your neighbor or the way you responded to your boss at work, that's not the way you should have behaved. Or the way you rebuke your child this morning, mm, you were harsh. You could have done that in a in a nice way. That's the conscience. You know why people nowadays say they are atheists? Oh, they're liars. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. Atheist believes in God. I challenge any atheist listening to me. By the way, if you don't know the meaning of atheist, atheist, theist coming from the Greek theo. A mean no. A no theist God, theos or God. So atheist mean, means somebody who does not believe in God. They are liars. They believe in God. Do you know why they 
purport, they purport to not believe in God because they want to have a good conscience. They want to act as if God doesn't exist. So for you to go as a man and sleep with another man, you have to kill the consciousness of the existence of God. I don't know if you understand the point. I'm trying to go deeper here. Because for an atheist to sin, because people who purport or pre pretend to be atheists, they are not atheists. They believe in God. So they're trying to annihilate the existence of God in their mind so that they can be at ease when sinning. Can you try to... Are you getting that? Do you get that? I wanted to get that. There is no such things like atheists. They do not exist. All those atheists, they're trying to put their conscience into coma. They're trying to make their conscience sleep so that they can sin. They can go to gay parades, check their evil, their evilness publicly. That's why they do. Because if you have your conscience, a man who has a conscience cannot sleep with a man. A woman who has a conscience cannot sleep with a woman. There is no way. An adult who has a conscience cannot sleep with a baby. There is no way he can do that. So, they're trying to kill their conscience and say, there is no God. They're trying to lie to themselves, say, hey, God doesn't exist. I'm free to do whatever I want. I'm my God. God doesn't... But somehow... Do you know why they dive into substance abuse like drug, alcohol? Because the conscience is awakened and galloped back to their brain. The conscience comes back. You, you cannot kill a conscience. The conscience comes back. You slept with a man yesterday. You should not be supposed to do that. It listens to the conscience. Say, no way, that couldn't be true. So he has to take methamphetamine, heroin, or whatever drugs to make the conscience sleep again, sleep back. But the conscience does not sleep forever. The conscience is going to wake up, come back. And the person going to get more methamphetamine to put the conscience back to sleep so that it can sin. Do you see the depth of the teaching tonight? Be blessed to have... Do not give me glory. Glory is to the God. We have riches of revelation in this word of God. And this is one... A small, a slight example of the revelation about the conscience. The most, the greatest thing that God put in our mind is our conscience. When you do something that is wrong, you know it's wrong. You're going to try to argue with your parents or argue if you sin against your children. You're going to try to convince your children when they are right, you're wrong as parent or the parents are uh, are right, you're wrong as children, you're going to try to argue, argue, but somehow you know, you know you're wrong. God put in our beings, inside our human beings, something powerful called conscience. That's the break. That's the break, you see? A car like without a break, wow, that's a, what a catastrophe. The conscience is our break. The break like a break in the, when the, a driver in front of an obstacle suddenly applies the break. Suddenly you aroused by anger. 
You want to take your revolver, your gun to shoot somebody? Hey, the conscience says, no, you don't have to do that. Calm down. Calm down. You're not supposed to insult your parent. You're not supposed to hit your sister. You're not supposed to hit your brother. Calm down. This is the conscience. That's why the verse says here, good conscience, a good conscience, on faith unfeigned, on faith unfeigned, a good conscience. Now that I, I hope you, you, you clearly understand the revelation about atheist people who purport or pretend God doesn't. No, they be, they are they are even the greatest believer in God. Atheist. I challenge any American or whatever atheist in the world to come and see and tell me God doesn't exist. If, he's, if the person is honest, you're right. What you, you just explained, that's true. That's why they have to abuse substances, use drugs, go to nightclubs. Those gay pride goers, when they are back in the emptiness of their bedrooms, they cry. After shaking the, the evil parts of their body, when they back, they cry. They laugh them. It's miserable. They have to, to inject in their body something to, to make them fly. To make them feel well. Oh, how can humanity be hopeless without Jesus Christ? I can be harsh, but I have compassion to people going through such problems. Because they don't have Jesus Christ. That's why we need to preach the hope to the world. We need to preach peace to the world. I'm always amazed when I hear so or so got a Nobel Prize. I don't know uh, which country Nobel Prizes are, again, uh, are from again. I don't know if it's a, a, a Swedish or I don't know the country. Again. Anyway, somewhere in Europe, Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize recipients are not even able to experience peace in their life, but they are Nobel Prize recipients. Oh, Mandela received a Nobel Prize. Such person received a Nobel Prize. You receive Nobel Prize, but you cannot sleep at night because you don't have peace, but you receive the Nobel Prize. Only Jesus Christ can give us the best peace ever. We should not turn to the noble community somewhere in, in Europe to get noble, 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 noble peace, noble peace prize. Peace is not on this earth. There is no way you can have peace on this earth without Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ. That's why Christianity should be the last oasis, oasis in this wilderness, spiritually wilderness we're living in. We're living in a spiritual wilderness, darkness. The only hope, the only light is Jesus Christ. The only oasis of peace, of hope in this infinite wilderness we live in, it, this dark and corrupt world, earth, the only oasis is Jesus Christ. So I think we're going to limit ourselves to chapter 1 and spend a few nights in this book. You see how only one verse can... Uh, take us to oceans of revelations. Now, 
Verse 6, now, now 5, now the end of the commandment is charity. Charity is the love of God in your heart. That is manifested in action. The way you act towards others, the way you react. Charity. Somebody who is not transformed by the Lord, the word of God cannot experience charity. And it should start in the household. How siblings behave to each other. See? Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure a heart. Oh yeah, we always uh, read that, yes. Uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, now, verse 6 now, from which some having swerved, swerved, meaning when they went astray, they went astray, swerved, look, think of a, a, a car swerving, a drunk driver swerving in the highway. What a catastrophe. Can you see the, can you pick, picture in highway, in the highway, highway I forty five, a drunk driver going at a speed speed of nearly a hundred per uh, hundred miles per hour, and at the same time swerving. What do we read here? From which some having swerved, swerved have turned aside into vain jangling. I like the phraseology of the, word, the, the Bible, the Word of God. I like the phraseology of the, the Bible. Jangling. Jangling. Meaning, vain, mundane or nonsense. Vain speech. Jangling. Vain jangling. Then discourse. They pretend they are doctors, they are teachers, they are pastors. But because they teach then doctrine, because they teach uh, 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 fables, genealogies, they teach tradition and customs of men, they give themselves to vain jangling. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they are famed. Yeah, that was, that's what I always teach. How come you want to guide people when yourself are blind? No, there's no way. Can a blind man guide other blind men? If they head into a Grand Canyon, they're going to plunge, dive into the waterless bottom of the Grand Canyon. Just picture the end. What a smash. You see? So, desiring, verse 7 again, to be teachers of the law, understanding, they do not even understand what they say. No, whereof they are film. They don't understand. But we know that the law is good if the man use it lawfully. Lawfully. Yeah, the, the law of God, the word of God is good. So you have to use it lawfully, meaning appropriately, in a good, in a good manner. Don't use the law of God for bad motives. God, don't use the word of God for a, a wrong mo motive. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for men's layers. Verse 10, for whore mongers, another word for... Uh, uh, prostitute, people who delve themselves in sexual immorality, for whore, whore mongers, 
for them that defile themselves. I was talking about the, the Gipperate, uh, Pride, uh, Carnival, Carnivals, yeah. Uh, they defile themselves for men, men stealers, uh, people stealing other men, for liars, you see, yeah, underline liars. People think lying is not something that is uh, benign. No, lying is not benign. Life, lying is not benign. Lying has serious consequences. So liars for a perjured person, perjury, even in American law, perjurers, serial perjurers, even one-time perjurers, a one-time perjurer can end up in, in jail. Now, what about God? You take an oath. God, I promise I take an oath to serve you. And you turn away, you go back to your own life. Oh, you are a perjurer because you take, a, take an oath to abide in the truth, only the truth and always the truth. So perjurers, perjur, perj, perjured persons, and if there be any other things, thing that is contrary to the sound doctrine, underline sound doctrine, sound doctrine, that's the only thing true believers, true disciples of Jesus Christ should be attached to, sound doctrine. Not false doctrines, not fables, genealogies, but sound doctrine, the one, the, the one we receive from the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles in the, the New Testament. Verse 11, according to the glorious gospel, oh, I like that, that expression, the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. You see, God committed to the trust of Paul Apostle Paul, the glorious gospel. And we need young men, people in this generation to whom God do, does the same, entrusting, entrusting, them, entrusting them with the glorious gospel. What a blessing. What a beautiful thing to be entrusted by God of the glorious gospel. Gospel, hallelujah, what a blessing. God entrust his glorious gospel to you and say, hey, my son, get it. Hold the torch. Get out of there. Get out of there. Get out. Make that glorious gospel shine because we are living in the dark age. Dark ages are not medieval times. Dark age are in the generation of TikTok, generation of internet, generation of uh, social media. We live, uh, we live in the dark age. We live in the dark age. And those dark age couldn't be darker. Trust me, they couldn't be darker. According, let's, let's, read again that, let's read again that beautiful verse, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. How many person today, persons today God can look at and say you are faithful. Blessed is any man God can point, look at and say I'm counting you as faithful and I put you in the ministry to serve me and to serve my Lord Jesus, my son Jesus Christ. Blessed is any man God can count Faithful. After putting him into the ministry. Faithful means you steadfast. You consistent. You don't, you don't go back. And I thank God 
by to the with the uh, for the fact I thank God for the fact that almost eleven years after that ministry began, next even thirteen year, thirteen years after that ministry, is, I'm steadfast. There's no retiring. You don't retire from the ministry. There is no retiring. There is no sabbatical. I don't know if you know the meaning of sabbatical. Uh, uh, is the system in some university where a teacher, a professor, a professor says, okay, I'm going to be off for two years. No, there's no sabbatical in the ministry. There's no retiring. You do it until you're dead or until, by the grace of God, you, re you leave this earth until you sleep, meaning you die. For us, for us Christians, we, we say sleeping and not dying because indeed we, we, we do not die. We sleep and we go in a place where we wait for the, the return of the, the Lord Jesus Christ who will resurrect the death, the dead. Yeah, I thank Again, verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who had enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. Look, Paul was before what? A sinner. And even worse, what? A blasphemer. Do you know that Paul contributed to the death of a wonderful, fervent disciple called Stephen? But he was ignorant. He thought he was serving God. He thought he was serving God, doing it zealously. When he was uh, heading to Damascus, trying to capture more disciples of the Lord, thinking he was serving the Lord, he was cut off, cut off of God by the Lord Jesus Christ, and. Uh, Go read, uh, I think, Act chapter 9 to see what happened. He was blind three days. And God has to uh, send uh, a, a young man, another fervent disciple, Ananias, to go and who went and uh, pray for Paul, lay hands on him, and uh, Paul recovered from his blindness and... Uh, he began a wonderful ministry of, of preaching the word of God with boldness, performing miracles around the world so that in two days, Apostle Paul reached cover the one part of the world, all the eastern region of the world. In two years, he covered it with the gospel. At the time, they didn't have even a bicycle. At the time, they didn't have even a radio, even a telegram. At the time, they didn't have internet. They didn't have TikTok, WhatsApp, for instant video and phone call. Two years, he covered a major part of the earth with the gospel. So, why can't we not do the same today with all the technology we have? A few hours ago, one or two hours, I was talking from a lady. Uh, well, uh, uh, sorry, talking with a lady from uh, from Australia. We still Monday, May the the thirteenth. But the, the time I was talking with her, they already. They already tomorrow, Tuesday, May 13. It was around 10 o'clock in the morning of a day. With technology, we can reach people. If Paul, in two years, reached one big part of the, the earth with the gospel, how cannot we do it today with all the technology we have at our disposition. So God only need need only needs God, uh, uh, faithful people. 
And I thank Christ Jesus, for our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Verse 13, <coughs> excuse me, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. Yeah, that's what I'm explaining. And he's acknowledging the fact that he, with his ignorance, he, with his uh, fervent and zealous ignorance, he, he, he contributed to the, 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 murder of, the murder of Stephen. And injurious, yeah, blasphemer and persecutor, injurious, better obtain mercy. You, you know, you see, we started the, the verse, verse, uh, verse two of this chapter, chapter one, first Timothy chapter one, verse two, with the word mercy. Now we have here the manifestation, the manifestation of this mercy. Somebody who killed a Christian, who killed a fervent disciple, who approved. Is uh, 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 stoning to death. He was forgiven by God. And when God forgives, he does what? He forgets. That's why God is wonderful. That's what I'm passionate about God. God won't say, Winton, what you did, I forgive you, but, but no. When God forgives you, it is as if you have never committed what you committed. When you understand that, you are in love with that God. Let's say you have, we have a president who pardons somebody who committed a, 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 murder, a murder. Don't you think that that murderer who was acquitted or pardoned by the president, don't you think that he's going to love that president's fight really with passion until his death? What can we do it for, for God? So when you ask for forgiveness, God forgives and forgets. We should do this, the same with each other. No, I forgive my brother, my sister, but I don't forget. No, you liar. You liar. You did not forgive. True forgiveness goes along with forgetness, if I may say. Again, verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained, I obtained mercy because I did it in, uh, ignorantly, ignorantly, in unbelief. Yeah, God understand that. He didn't know. He thought he was zealous. He thought he was doing something good. The same thing we see with uh, the, the, son of, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, and who? Abi, who? Yeah, you should remember. Leviticus chapter 10 from verse 1. Let's see. You have to memorize that. You study. You memorize. You go back to what we studied. So that you, you should have, that's why you should have your notebooks note, and study. Go back. Go to your notes. Study. So that the next time you won't forget. So Verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Who can tell me the main and only purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what? Deliverance from sin. That's it. Yeah. So, it's wonderful how Paul acknowledged that he was the chief sinner. <laughs> chief sinner. Verse 16 how by how be it how be it for this cause I obtain mercy 
that in me first Jesus Christ might, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, for eternal life. Verse 17, we go into the, the, the end of the first chapter. We're going to stop the chapter 1 tonight. Now unto the King eternal. I like verse 17, how he, he, he gives glory to God. Let's read together. Now uh, to God and to, uh, to the, uh, specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ here. No, not to God first, to God, and so uh, to God. Now on, on to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 18, verse 18. This charge I commit unto you, I commit unto thee, unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecy which went before on thee, that you by them might war a good warfare. We don't underline, might war a good warfare. My son Winter, many Christians war a bad warfare. Mostly American Christians. This is one of the verses, one of the verses I should have mentioned with you. They war a wrong warfare. If you want to change the country with weaponry, made of steel on cannon powder or whatever, or bullet ammunition, you are waging, you are warring a wrong war. A wrong warfare. A warfare is not against blood and flesh. It is spiritual. So we have to equip ourselves with spiritual weaponry. This is a good verse. verse. Next step. Let's next, next end. 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning have... This is the verse you should used to help atheists. They put away their own conscience. They take their conscience, they put it to, they put the, the conscience into coma, into sleep. With all kinds of substances, drug, methamphetamine, heroin, uh, and so forth. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shibrek. I like that word, shibrek. Shibrek. And Apostle Paul exposed two false pastors, verse 20, on whom is Emenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Those are they were the false preachers Paul is referring to when he introduced the, the, this first chapter. When he was talking about uh, uh, people uh, uh, swerving who have turned aside into vain jangling, verse 6, people teaching fables, genealogies, and now, in verse 20, he discloses two of them. He, Menaeus, and Alexander, whom Paul delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let me give a word of thankfulness to God for this wonderful revelation we just shared. And also pray for the night. Our dear 
Almighty Father, I have no words to express my uh, thankfulness for these wonderful words we just shared. The word of wisdom, the word of life, the word of hope, giving us peace. Peace, all the money of this earth cannot buy. Peace we cannot attain by the riches of this earth and also hope and also light. Father, I implore your grace for these kids. Please, Father, give them a burning passion for the word, thy word. Give them a burning passion for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Father, lead them to the way of uh, repentance. Father, I implore your grace that uh, they, you can grant them grant them the, the, the gift of repentance. Father, you want to be deliv delivered from sin. Father, give them to be delivered by sin, to have this fiery, burning passion for the, for the truth. Oh, Father, I implore your grace so that we can have in, that, in this generation, in these dark ages, that couldn't be darker, so that we can have young men who are bold, valiant for the truth, who can hold forth the glorious gospel of the our Son Jesus Christ as a sword and as a torch in order to cut into pieces these dark ages the darkness of these dark ages and to shed light. Thank you, Father, for what you, uh, we read and what we studied. Give to these kids the, the ability to memorize, to retain, to not forget, to not, to not forget what they, they learned. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for the, the edge of protection with which you are surrounding this house, our bedrooms, and also the neighboring houses. Father, thank you for everything, for your kindness in our lives, for your mercy, your forgiveness. It is in the mighty and wonderful, powerful, glorious, excellent, magnificent name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we have prayed. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.